I like German things. The Beatles like German things. There are a lot of German things which are good. But a German Beatles records any good? Let's find out. Prost. Hi, I'm Andrew from Parlogram Auctions. And in this video, I'm gonna take you on a journey through the Beatles German albums, where I'll not only be showing you all of their German records, but also give you some recommendations about the best sounding ones and those you should avoid. As you know, Germany has a very special place in Beatles history. Aside from enhancing both their personal and professional lives, it was in Hamburg that they secured their first recording contract, which proved to be one of, if not the, most important breaks in their career. It was, after all, the German recording of My Bonnie, which initially brought them to the attention of Brian Epstein. Those Polydor recording sessions with Bert Kampfert in June 1961 and then later in May and June 1962 produced technically some of the finest sounding recordings of the Beatles' career, and they still stand up today. The Beatles' first appearance on an album was My Bonnie, which came out in Germany in April 1962. First pressings are highly prized and very expensive, but you don't have to spend a huge amount of money to get hold of these great recordings. They're all out there on a number of budget compilations for next to nothing, and I've never heard a bad sounding one. The album was a modest success, but interest in the group in Germany quickly faded away. Even after that exploded onto the scene in the UK in early 1963, EMI's German arm Electrola totally ignored the Please Please Me album. It wasn't until November that year that one of their albums was finally released in Germany, and that was with the Beatles, which interestingly was released on the 12th of November, 10 days before its UK release. This German pressing is interesting to collectors mainly for the inclusion of the so-called hi-hat version of All My Loving, where Ringo taps his hi-hat five times as a count to Paul's vocal. It's puzzling as to why this version is on the German album and not the UK release. Was the tape sent to Germany once originally intended for the UK release? The original master tape box for the UK stereo pressing states that it was remixed from twin track stereo, equalized and compressed on the 1st of November 1963, and was, as we know, released in the UK three weeks later on the 22nd of November. Was there really enough time between the compilation of this tape on the 1st of November and its release on the 12th of November in Germany to press enough copies for a full release? Or had Germany received a tape which had been compiled before the UK one? This would certainly explain why it had a different version of All My Loving. The same variations occur on the German mono pressing too, suggesting that Odeon folded the stereo master to create the mono pressing rather than use a separate dedicated mono master as in the UK. Although it's a less than perfect stereo mix, it does sound less fuzzy than the UK pressing. And that, together with those small variations, make it a much more enjoyable listen. It wasn't until February 1964 that Germany got around to issuing the Please Please Me album. This time, it wasn't on Odeon, but on the Herzu label. Herzu, which translates from German as Listen, was, and still is, Germany's top TV listings magazine. They had an arrangement with Electrola to issue albums using their brand name, of which this was the first by the Beatles. Like with the Beatles before it, this album was issued in both mono and stereo, but sounds, as you would expect being cut from a lower generation copy tape, very flat and dull. So if you're looking for great quality sound, I wouldn't recommend this first pressing. The 1973 reissue of this album, on the other hand, is a totally different matter. Somehow, the Electrola engineers in Cologne managed to eliminate the heavy-handed compression and 60s sounding EQ from their source tape to produce easily the finest sounding stereo pressing of this album I've heard. This outstanding cutting can not only be found on this issue, but also on the mid to late 70s Apple labeled pressings, which was housed in the more familiar cover. 
The crucial detail is that both carry the A2 B2 matrix. The next German album release was The Beatles' Beat, which dates from April 1964 and was the first of two 1960s German only compilations. It included some recent single A and B sides, along with the selection of tracks from the already released with The Beatles. It's an average sounding album, but with a great cover. July 1964 saw the release on Odeon of the A Hard Day's Night LP. The cover was slightly different from the UK release, but it retained the original running order. It was, however, retitled as Yeah, 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 which German teenagers loved, but their parents hated. The sound is nothing more than average and not a patch on the UK pressing. Next up in the catalogue from September 1964 was Something New, which did the job of filling the two-month gap between Yeah 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 and November's Beatles for Sale. Although it shares the same track listing and front cover design as the US version, it uses slightly different mixes, most notably the extended And I Love Her, where the final guitar pattern is repeated six times instead of four. Not as the result of using an alternate take, just one of creative editing. It was also the last German Beatles album to be issued in mono. Like with the Beatles, Beatles for Sale was released in Germany before the UK, by three weeks in fact. It contains the same track selection and running order, but sound-wise doesn't have the breath of life of the UK stereo first pressing. The release of their next German album, Beatles 65, must have confused fans when it was released in May 1965 because unlike the US version, most of the tracks on it had been released on the Beatles for Sale album six months previously. The album not only copies the title of the US version, but it's track listing too. And whilst the tracks from Beatles for Sale again don't shine as bright as the UK version, it's a respectable sounding record. The UK had to wait until December 1966 for its first compilation album, but by June 1965, Germany was releasing its second, which was simply titled The Beatles' Greatest. On the face of it, it seems like quite a predictable run-of-the-mill album, with little to appeal to collectors. But it does in fact contain a couple of rare and interesting mixes. Firstly, there's the hi-hat version of All My Loving from With The Beatles, which we talked about earlier, together with an early 1965 stereo mix of I Want To Hold Your Hand, which predates and is subtly different from the one which was included on the A Collection of Beatles' Oldies album. Also, the version of I Feel Fine on here is the US mix with that massive reverb all over it. Despite the reprocessed stereo mix of She Loves You, this is a great sounding album and much more entertaining than a collection of Beatles oldies, which for me is easily the worst sounding album in the original UK album catalogue. The Beatles Greatest proved to be popular in other countries too. For example, it was released in this cover in the Netherlands in 1967 and also in Israel with this bizarre so-called President's cover in 1970. The UK first stereo pressing of Help is a notoriously poor sounding affair. The 1965 German pressing didn't do it any favours either. Even the 1973 Red Label repressing, which had transformed Please Please Me, sounds just as poor and is too best avoided. The original pressings of Rubber Soul sound pretty flat too, in both their domestic and export issues, but this 1970s pressing on the Blue Odeon label is a great sounding disc. Its only flaw is a dropout on Norwegian wood, but otherwise it's certainly one which I would happily listen to many times. Released a week earlier than the UK issue, this white, red and gold 1966 first pressing of Revolver is again rather flat and unexciting. This early 1970s pressing, which shares the same A1-B1 matrix, unsurprisingly also sounds lifeless. But this 1970s Apple pressing, on the other hand, is a revelation. The sound is totally transformed here. It's got everything the other pressings don't. Bass detail and a real energy which is missing from any other pressing I've heard, even the UK one of the same vintage. I strongly urge you to find one, buy it and enjoy it, I guarantee you won't be disappointed. If Charles Martin ever remixes Revolver, he could do a lot worse than use this pressing as his guide. 
The German Sergeant Peppers in its original 1967 first pressing doesn't come anywhere near to the sound of the UK pressing and is disappointingly dull overall. Like Revolver before it, it sounds just like the copy tape it's from, although it does have the added detraction of this candy striped inner sleeve. Happily though, it, like Revolver, is also transformed on this 1970s Apple pressing. Now this really is a tremendously exciting sounding pressing with great bass and a dynamic high end without being harsh on the ears. I highly recommend picking this one up too and adding it to your collection. Magical Mystery Tour was, like in the UK, originally released in Germany as a two EP set on the green Odeon label inside the familiar booklet cover. But unlike in the UK, the EP set was deleted as soon as stocks ran out and Electrola elected to replace it with their version of the US album. That was released in conjunction once again with Her Zoo in September 1971 on the Apple label as SHZE 327. First pressings, like the US album, contained simulated stereo tracks on side two, which clearly wasn't good enough for hi-fi loving Germans. So very soon after the album came out, Electrola ordered up true stereo versions from Abbey Road and in doing so created one of the finest sounding Beatles LPs ever. It's fairly easy to tell the difference between first and second pressings. First pressings had a B1 side two matrix, whilst the matrix of the improved second and subsequent pressings with the true stereo tracks all end in B3. First pressing covers had the Hertzu Langspielplatte logo in the top left hand corner, whereas the second pressings from 1973 had the Hertzu turntable logo. Later pressings, like this copy from 1980 with the Apple symbol on the front, contain the same great sounding cutting too and are a little easier and cheaper to find. The White Album came in a similar format to the UK pressing, with an individually numbered top opening gatefold cover with poster, photos and even rougher black inner sleeves than the UK pressing. The vinyl is heavy and the pressing quality is excellent, but the sound, although bright and clean, is lacking in the bass department and is missing the warmth and presence of the UK pressings. This early 1980s copy of Yellow Submarine on Apple was, like Revolver and Sgt Pepper, a real surprise. It's a very full and lively sounding cut with a great bass response and is, despite a massive amount of limiting on the opening chord of It's All Too Much, a refreshing alternative to the lacklustre ambience of the UK pressing. Abbey Road and Hey Jude are very similar to the White Album in sound in their original first pressing guise. Clean, very transparent sounding cuts, but no match for the UK pressings. By the way, the best sounding pressing of Hey Jude is the early 1970s export pressings on Apple CPCS 106. The later Parlophone pressing is good, but not better. Although matrix numbers are the best way to identify the best sounding pressings, they're not always visible, especially when you're buying online. But some of the best sounding pressings I've mentioned already can be identified in another way. After the initial first pressings with the white, red and gold labels, the albums were reissued with these blue labels in 1969 and employed the new EEC catalogue numbers which replaced the original SMO series. Although some blue label pressings of certain albums can be found with the old SMO numbers, such as on this 1969 copy of Rubber Soul. These blue label repressings carried the 062 prefix to their catalog numbers and generally used original first pressing cuts, sometimes with an added X after the matrix, but they're generally pretty dull and lifeless. What I recommend you do is seek out pressings which have catalog numbers beginning with the 072 prefix, which were completely new recuts of the tapes using a new Neumann lathe. So if you're into the audio angle of this madness, those are the ones to collect. They really will surprise you in a good way. They're not that hard to find as either eBay and Discogs are usually full of them. If you fancy getting hold of some right away, head over to our website, parlogramauctions.com, where we've always got a few in stock. There are of course a host of German export and special book club pressings, some of which are very rare indeed, and they deserve a video in their own right. 
But that's all for this one. I hope you enjoyed it and found it helpful in deciding what, if any, of these great sounding pressings to collect. Give us a big thumbs up and please hit the subscribe before you go. But I'll say I'll feed the same for now and thanks for watching.